Th thank you very much. Um, so tonight I will be talking about hexagonal architecture and Elixir. Uh, actually, even if you're not doing Elixir at work, uh, just like I do, uh, you can still have a lot of takeaways from that because hexagonal architecture is not bound to a language. Uh, but first, let's talk about some buzzwords. So you may, have, you may have heard of hexagonal architecture before, or things like ports and adapter architecture, clean architecture, onion architecture, domain-driven design like the DDD thing, even sourcing, secures, etc. Um, these are a lot of buzzwords and this talk is not to sell you some other buzzwords. Uh, I'm, going, I'm here to explain you some concept and the philosophy behind that. So right away I'm giving you the conclusion of this talk. Uh, the takeaway of tonight is if you want to write maintainable software it's good to separate the domain <coughs> from the infrastructure. Okay. So, thank you for the introduction. My name is Nicholas. Indeed, I'm a web developer at Buzzbud, and we mainly do JavaScript. I'm doing a bit of Elixir uh, on site project for fun, uh, and I'm enjoying coming here every two months. I introduced two concepts so, domain and infrastructure. Let's start with that. Uh, the domain, so I'm working at Buzzbud, and we, we're dealing with uh, buses. So, we have things like passengers, seats, amenities. Uh, departures, uh, transfer, legs, all of this vocabulary I will share and I will talk about that with my project manager, with the sales people, with all the experts uh, of the bus transportation that work at BusBud. We also have concepts like uh, discount code, taxes, checkout cart that you may have in your business too. Like this is not specific to us but still it's business logic. And the domain is all about that, like the business logic of what your application is doing. Whereas the database, the Redis cache, the fact that you're calling a third party server through HTTP or FTP or SOAP or anything, these are all part of the infrastructure, meaning the technical details to make it work in real life. But don't get fooled, like software, is a mean to a business end. That means even if we don't have a web application, we can still do our business. It will be less convenient, we will have to go to Gare d'Autocar of Montréal to sell some bus tickets, uh, but still it's doable. The software and the technique is here to help us go worldwide and go faster and go cheaper. But that means the infrastructure, the part of the software which is infrastructure, it's a detail. Like, we don't care that much which kind of database we will be using. In production, at the end, yes, it matters. But when we're dealing with the software, it's not the first concern. In fact, the infrastructure should be able to change without the business to care. I could be using a MongoDB database or a PostgreSQL database and the business people in the company, they don't care. They just want it to work. So, it shouldn't care in fact, and it doesn't really happen. So you can ask yourself, can your project manager read your source code and understand the, the business part of it? Often you get domain and infrastructure mixed together. So here is a small Elixir snippet. It's not the best one in the world, but I just wanted to keep it short and to the point. Um, I've got a problem with this kind of code, uh, which is if I want to talk to my project manager about the date to ISO 8601, which is a, a, a date format that I need to, 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 to pass uh, my, my date in my program, and then I'm using a Tentacat client, I instantiate with an access token so I can connect to uh, GitHub, actually, and get a list of pull requests. Well, all of this, this is technical details. And this function is about business, like, this function is a list of pull requests open time until today. So if I'm developing an application about pull requests like GitHub statistics, I will be discussing about that, but I don't care about the, the format of the date or the fact that I'm using the tentacle client. So these parts are problematic. They hide the business. So it's hard to see the business. And because it's hard to see the business, it's also hard to test the business. Like, if I want to test this code, I will need to mock the date of the system because I don't want my test to depend on the date when I run them. Uh, and I will also need to, to mock the Tentacat client 
but what if tomorrow I'm finding another better client or I want to go to GitLab instead of GitHub? I will need to change this code and it's hard to change this code and the business code because it's tangled with infrastructure. That also means it's hard to change the infrastructure, so going to GitLab for example, without breaking the business rules which are in the middle. So ask yourself again, is your business easy to read? Is your business easy to test? Let's dive into hexagonal architecture. So for me, hexagonal architecture, it's the simplest way to do this separation, domain infrastructure. This is the most simple way you can have to start with this principle. How simple? That simple. Like, draw two circle. In the middle, you will have your domain code, no infrastructure at all. And on the outside, you will have your, inf your infrastructure code to make it work. There is one rule, which is the outside, the infrastructure. It depends on the inside, on the domain, not the contrary, not the opposite. Your domain doesn't know about the infrastructure, and this is very important. So, dependency rule. I told you hexagonal architecture. Here is the hexagon. So here is a fun fact. Um, there is nothing about the hexagon. It's marketing thing. <laughs> it is. Alistair Cogburn, he's a consultant. He, he's the author of the hexagonal architecture and he needs a name, a sticky name for people to remind of this kind of concept. And a geometrical shape is very nice. It's not too simple. It's not like a triangle or, or, or a square, uh, but still it's easy to draw. There is some kind of symmetry in the middle. So that's why you have an hexagon and that's it. Focus on the hexagon. Now, you have your domain, you want to do some logic, okay, but to do so, you need at some point to do side effects, you need to do real life things, like I, I, at some point, I need to call GitHub API to retrieve the list of pull requests. How can I do that? How can, how can I make the infrastructure depend on the domain and not the contrary? Well, if you're doing object-oriented programming, you know that you have something called an interface. And what you do, in fact, is you make your domain depend on an interface. And what is an interface is you're defining the intention, what you want your code to do. I want to retrieve the list of pull requests. I don't care about the technical details. It's just the intention, the high level intention. It's part of the domain. I'm using the words that I will be using talking to my project manager. And then I have an infrastructure adapter that will implement this interface and will be injected in production to make it happen, to make it work. Now, call the interface a port, and you have the ports and adapter architecture, which was the original name of the hexagonal architecture, and it makes sense when you look at that. One final rule, inside the hexagon, business language only. Like, try to skip all of the HTTP, FTP, database, etc. No technical details inside. Try to stick to the business language. And now you have an hexagon, you can make it work. And you have two sides of the hexagon. On the left side, you will represent all of the public interface of your application. Like you're, you're exposing your logic through a web UI, for example, or a REST API, or both, or IoT, or maybe your test will be using your domain like that. On the right side, you will draw the, the adapters for uh, manage, like providing services to your domain to do its work. So external uh, third-party services, databases, etc. The benefits of that kind of architecture is the flexibility. You can basically swap any kind of adapters and it doesn't change the hexagon. So you get a, a, a very high flexibility uh, um, uh, highly uh, configurable software uh, if you design your software like that. That means you can plug any other infrastructure into your software and still make it work. So you can think about different environments and spoiler alert, when you're testing it's a different environment than when you're in production so at least you have two different environments. Actually, the test, they are the first consumer of your application, not only the user, not only your REST API, but the test, they are a consumer of your application. 
It also allows you to defer the technical de the decisions. So at the beginning of the project, you may wonder, okay, what kind of database I will be using, uh, what kind of thing that I need to implement, will it be FTP or HTTPS, uh, what will be the protocol with the partner. All of this you may not know because you don't have a lot of information and you will learn later in the project. And Doing that, you can still start working on your software and at that point when you learn what you actually need, you can just change the infrastructure details without having to dig into all of the domain logic and, and risk to break everything. That also means you can start with something simple as this, this is really important. In Elixir, uh, what do we have? Elixir is not an object-oriented program uh, language. Uh, it's more functional, so you don't have interfaces, but you have something else. Uh, so if you're familiar with Elixir, you will be familiar with behaviors. And it's the same ID behind. So let's, look uh, let's have a look uh, at behaviors. So this is a behavior. You can see the I at the beginning, which will, may remind you about interfaces. It could be, yes, it was at the beginning, but I like to name my behavior like that because I read them as I give dates, I do something. And so I'm focusing on what does this thing do? Well, I do that. It's active. So this is a behavior, this is a module uh, with this little callback keyword. Uh, and you're defining the, 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 the behavior, the, um, the signature of what does this thing do? Well, this thing uh, has a method today which returns a string, for example. And this other one has a method open pull request and it returns me a list of pull requests. This is a type I define in the open time module, which is part of the domain. No technical detail. Let's have a look at the open time module. So I define the pull request type here. Uh, and I define, I still have my, my function, like I will get, I will, I want to have the list of open time pull requests until today. And with behavior, I can just program to a behavior. So I know at some point in my application, I have something that will give me the date. So I asking this thing, okay, give me the date of today. Give me the list of open pull requests. And then I'm doing the rest of my logic, which could be improved, but this is another point. Now let's implement this behavior, like let's make it work in real. So I will be using the, um, the system for the date, and I will be using GitHub for the pull request. So other keyword, behavior, I'm referring to the behavior um, I declared before. And here I'm implementing the method. I need to implement it, otherwise uh, the compiler it won't be happy. And here I can put the technical details, like the fact that I'm using a date or the fact that I'm using Tentacat uh, that needs a connection and everything to make it work. So I separated the domain and the infrastructure. Finally, I need to make it work. So in my configuration, I just need to plug and say, okay, you will be using in production this particular uh, thing to get dates and this one to get pull request. In my test, I could be using another configuration. So now I can provide mock pull request reader, mock dates giver. And there is a very nice uh, library to do that, which is called Mox, that I recommend if you want to, to do proper mocking in test. That is based on that, based on behaviors. So let's write a first test, which is really simple. I, I'm, okay, I'm testing my, uh, my method and I'm, the context is there is no pull request, so it should return an empty array. Let's keep it simple. So I can mock, I can define what today will return in that context. And I can do the same with my pull request reader. And here I control the infrastructure so I can guide my test to simulate the context. And I'm not bound to Tentacut client. I can swap the adapter. I can, I can define in production another library. I can go for GitLab. I can go for anything. My test is not coupled to my implementation details. 
and this is all, uh, also good. Like, I, if I want to change the library, I don't have to rewrite my tests. So in Elixir, I will say, program to a behavior. Just like in object-oriented programming, you will program to an interface. Nothing in all of that is new. It's just another way to put it and another way to look at your software design. But it works in any language, and I, I think this, this logic uh, holds everywhere. Really important also, use the domain language in your behavior. Like, try to focus on, on the domain, on, on the vocabulary you're using in your code. Try to make it represent the concept that you're talking with your, your um, business people. Because doing so, you will ensure that uh, you're developing the right thing. Now, there are a few limits, though. Telling you, I'm gonna tell you everything. <laughs> So the, the main limit is that this is really simple. So it doesn't scale. It doesn't help you to scale. Like at some point you need to build real life application, right? Uh, not just a, a fun side project. So your domain will grow, your infrastructure will grow. And if you only just separate them, well, you need more guidance and take more decisions to make it maintainable. Uh, to go further, I will recommend two different books. The first one is a clean architecture book, actually. So you can see here the diagram, which is like the summary of the book, and it looks the same. Like at the heart, you have the domain, the business, and then you have more layers. So it's totally compatible. You can start with a simple uh, hexagonal architecture and then at some point you can add different layers in your infrastructure because you're differentiating the use cases, the controllers, etc. And for the domain, for the inside, I would recommend this book, which is not an easy read, of course. Uh, totally compatible again. The only architecture thing that you need to apply uh, to, to follow this book is to separate the domain from the rest of the code. And then in this book, you will focus on the importance of the language, on the context, on the modeling patterns, so you can, you can design a very strong model, a very strong domain, and make it scale at your company level. So from tonight, remember, separate the domain from the infrastructure. And this is it. Thank you. <laughs>